Yeah, we built communion, a community already this, this uh, last Thursday already, didn't we? Uh, were you in the, the pool parade? Uh, for the last two years, we, we were part of the, the water carnival where we had our bus in the parade and we were just walking around and handing out flyers. This year, we wanted to be in the boat parade, which was fantastic because it gave uh, so many of you the opportunity to come out and enjoy fellowship with our community people. It was a wonderful time. And we made second place with our float. Isn't that something? <laughs> That's our flow with our kiddos on it. It's a Jeep with the VBS theme, Roar. So we're excited about that one. <laughs> they had a blast. It was great. Is that the last one? Thank you, by the way, for all the volunteers that came, up, uh, came out for, for this event and helped in one capacity or the other. Thank you so much. Give them a big hand. It was a great event. I loved it. All right. Well, I want to continue with the, with the series of the kingdom of God. Did you get something out of this series already? This three weeks before uh, that, that, that I preached? Um, you know, when the Lord put it on my heart, I read through a couple of parables. And there was something in the parables of the kingdom of God that stuck, stuck out to me so, so strong that I, I knew the Lord wants me to preach on the kingdom of God. And so once I got into it, I, I realized just everything that God showed me was like I, I had to preach about those things. And if you remember the sequence, I would just want to challenge you. Just this morning too, I, I just felt like if you can put the Lord to the test, test him in one thing, seek first the kingdom of God. I just thought it this morning. I got ready for church and it was like I had many thoughts in my head. But I, I, I felt like, Seek first the kingdom of God. Man, if Jesus says that to us, seek first the kingdom of God and all other things shall be given unto you. Try it out. <laughs> Let, let's just try it out. Let's see what it is that Jesus says and all other things shall be given to you. If it's marriage, if it's finances, if it's needs that are need, need to be taken care of, it's, if it's obstacles or something, let God figure it out for your life. But seek first the kingdom of God. I really felt like this morning, maybe I should put this challenge out there because I, I believe Christ wants to give us this challenge. If you seek first the kingdom of God, watch what he will add to your life. Just watch. You know, all of our life, all of our, our Christian life, I, and, and this uh, three weeks that I was preaching about the kingdom of God, I had to start out with kingdom reality because we live not just Christianity, amen? We're not just living a Christian name, a Christian faith. We live kingdom life. We live in our life kingdom reality. As we celebrate communion, we are part of the kingdom of Christ. When Christ Jesus came, he, he established the kingdom. The kingdom is already not yet. We have the not yet part, and there's going to be a, a glory in heaven. But the kingdom already, it, there's already here. All the disciples that came to, to Jesus, when Jesus rose from the dead it, this is how the acts of the apostles starts the acts of the apostles starts with jesus telling them uh, teaching them about the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god and the disciples so much so he talks about the kingdom of god that the disciples asked jesus the question are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of israel and jesus says it's not for you to know the hour of the time and the time but, so it's like, you don't worry about the timing. The timing is in God's hand. There's one thing that you got to do. Get filled. Get an extra dose of the Holy Spirit. It's going to come. Pentecost is going to come soon. And when I empower you, and the, the filling of the Holy Spirit is always a filling for witness, a, fill, a filling for power for witness. It's not to feel good, amen? I mean, it does feel good. It feels wonderful to feel the presence of God, but it is always to render something, to render, I want to say to render our, our lives fruitful, to go out there, not just to feel good here, and then to walk out and forget everything that happened. God wants to give us a feeling uh, who was it, also Chamber, he always said, God gives us mountaintop experiences, uh, not because we should dwell there, but it's for the valley that's ahead of us. We need to take the glory of God, we need to take the filling of God with us into the week, into the workplace, into our families and homes and neighborhoods, and to spread the aroma of Christ wherever we go. Amen? And this is the kingdom of God. So it's, it, we live in a kingdom reality. It's not just about going to church on Sunday. It's not religion. 
It's so opposite of religion. It's a relationship. It's being a part of God's realm, the realm of God where he wants to be active and alive and move and, and touch and, and, and save people. And so I, I talked about kingdom reality. Then the other one, I, I felt like, you know, God arrested my heart. was like, I've got to preach about um, lost and found. Because very often when we, when, when we have this awakening that, man, God wants more from a life than just being a Christian by name, sometimes it catches us off, off guard, right? And we're like, but man, my life is just so messed up and I actually ran away from God and I don't know if he wants to receive me back, if there is anything left for me even. So I was preaching about the state of lost and foundness. Um, sometimes where, where God catches us and we got to come back because God has still a purpose for us. And then last, the last uh, sermon of the series, then I, uh, no, the, the last sermon that I had before we had guest speakers here uh, was about Kingdom Key. Do you remember that one? We had a door set up here and I made my, my fantastic little key that will always stick in your minds. It's the key of repentance, right? There's only one way to God, and that's by the key of repentance. It's not a box full of eggs, and so many people want to have that. that that's the truth. I, I, my ticket to heaven is if I did more good deeds than bad deeds. But God says, I don't care about your good deeds and how many outweigh what. I, it's all about, did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And did you repent of your sin? Did you repent of your former ways? That's the key that fits the keyhole and that, that, that door, and that's Jesus Christ. So we talked about kingdom key. And I feel like today I have another challenge for us. And I want to, it's, it's a sermon that I, I call uh, Seed and Soil. I want to talk today about seed and soil because when it comes to kingdom work, when it comes to us being fruitful in the kingdom of God, when it comes to us living Christianity the way it's supposed to be lived, there's one element that we have to be very careful and pay close attention to, and that's the seeds and the soil. And there is a, a parable of uh, the, the parable of the sower, and I'm going to get into this a little bit later, <clears throat> but I just want to say maybe a challenging sentence that, that I f felt like God gave me. You know, God wants us to be holy, right? God he says, uh, this is your calling uh, in, in uh, Second uh, Thessalonians. Uh, the, the calling on your life, this is the purpose of God for your life, your holiness. So God wants us to be holy, but holiness is not the last end mean. Holiness is always for a purpose. It is for fruit bearing, I want to say. And we've talked so much already about bearing fruit. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God was never meant in itself to be a holiness movement. For like monks sitting around and just chanting, being holy, having a most holy thoughts and holy lives. It was the kingdom of God was always meant to be a fruit bearing movement. A fruit bearing movement. And this was the thought that the, where God just showed it to me. As soon as I got into the parables and I read them, every parable I read was something about in those parables that was somehow not just about feeling good, but somehow about bearing fruit. That the kingdom of God, that our Christianity, our life is about bearing fruit. And I could sum it up and I could say, our life here on earth is like field work. We are field workers. We are field workers and the, all, all of those parables, so many of them are talking about kingdom work, field work. There's like we're workers and what, what, what do the workers in the field do? Stand around, watch the birds? <laughs> no, right? They're doing some work. They're doing some work. They're doing something. And it is, about, it is for a cause and the cause is fruit bearing. I just want to prove this here. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, um, turn to Mark chapter 4. And there's just so many parables. And I just want to read like uh, those elements within those parables. Let me just start with Mark chapter 4 in verse 7. We read something from the parable of the sower uh, from the gospel of Mark. And in this one, uh, again, it says, And other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up, and it choked it, and it yielded no grain. It's not about where it was placed, if, it, if the seed felt comfortable there or not, or uncomfortable there or not. It's about yielding no grain. 
It didn't bring forth any fruit. Verse 8, uh, at the bottom of verse 8, it talks about, and the good ground, and it yielded 30-fold and 60-fold and 100-fold. Gospel of Matthew reversed the order, but it doesn't really matter. It's like it's all about bearing fruit and, and many felt fruit. Verse 19, when you go further down, um, it says, but the cares of the world, is where Jesus explains the parable, uh, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of the riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word of God, and it proves unfruitful. Again, unfruitful. It just proves unfruitful. It's not about it. it, it, it it's not about feeling good. It, it's about bearing fruit. Everything is about bearing fruit. Verse twenty. You see the same thing again. But those that were sown in good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. The whole thing is about bearing fruit. In verse 28, uh, let me just go to 28, you have the parable of the seed growing. Um, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. And then he sleeps and he rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows. And he knows not how. And the earth produces by itself. Again, it's not just blessing the ground and throwing seeds on the ground, but it's about the earth producing something. It's this, something needs to come forth from it. And verse 32, uh, sorry, where am I at? Verse 32, when, when it says, uh, the parable of the mustard seed, so many parables. Uh, again, uh, what, what can we compare the kingdom of God to? Uh, it's like a mustard seed, even though it's the smallest. It, when it's uh, planted, it grows up to become larger than all garden plants and uh, puts out large branches so that, it's so that, so that the birds of the air can make nests in it. It's not just to stand there and look pretty, but it has a purpose. Every pair, and when we go to the Gospel of Matthew, um, Gospel of Matthew, and this is now, it starts with a challenge here. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, the laborers in the vineyard, and for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went on early in the morning to hire laborers in the vineyard. Now, what is a labor? We talked already about laborers are not standing arounders, right? They're doing something. People are supposed, just think about it. We are supposed to actually do something with our lives. That's mind-blowing. We are actually supposed to do something with our life. Now, we cannot do it by our own strength. Amen? This is what God adds to it. But our lives need to be tilled and sown. We, we got to do, our lives are meant for bearing fruit. We, we, we talked about it, I, I talked already about it in, in, in other sermons too. In Matthew chapter 21, we have another parable. It's the parable of the tenants. Uh, where the master of the house, he planted the vineyard and he put, put out a fence around it and he dug wine presses uh, in it and built a tower and leased it to the tenants and went into another country, another gospel says, uh, where he should receive the kingdom. And then when he comes back, uh, this, this is what I like, when the season for fruit drew near, again, I brought food, when the season for fruit drew near, he sent out his servants to the tenants to get the fruit. He didn't send out his servants to go back to the vineyard that he planted to throw a party. He sent back the tenants to pick up some of the fruit. Where is the fruit at? Is it ripe yet? Has it come out yet? Is it there yet? Is the fruit there yet? This is the master. God is interested in fruit bearing. Holiness is what gets us into, into unity with God, but it will healthy things always grow. When we're healthy in our Christian walk with God, there will come fruit for my life. And, this, and the kingdom of God talks all about fruit bearing. In uh, chapter 25, we have another parable. It's the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents where the master just, he goes away and he gives to his servants, uh, one of them five talents, to the other one three talents, and to the other one one talent. Not a gospel records it as ten, five, and one. It doesn't really matter. But as he's coming back, then he says, now uh, in verse 19, now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Again, he didn't come back to throw a party. He didn't come back to check in how things are going, if everybody's healthy and stuff. They came back to settle accounts. Again, like, where's the fruit? 
Where, what have you done with those talents? And the one who had five talents, he said, Master, I invested the five things, and I made you another five, and he's a good and faithful servant. And the one who has two talents, what does the master say? Good and faithful servant again, because he made two talents. Now he doesn't ridicule him and say, why did you only make two? I gave the other one five, but he made five. I expect from you five as well. No, it's in accordance to what God has handed out to us. we got to be faithful with the stuff that God has given us. Amen? And only the one who has received only one thing, in one gospel he records it as having buried it in the ground because he fears the master. You know, if the fear of God is all we have, we've got nothing. <laughs> you know, our life is supposed to bear fruit. God wants to invest into a life and a changed life, change life. God wants to do something with a life. He wants to save your neighbors. He wants to save your schoolmates. He wants to save your spouses. He wants to save people all around us. We cannot bury the things that God has given us. Another gospel says, instead of burying it in the ground, he put it in a handkerchief and put it away. Did you ever put something in it? We don't have handkerchiefs, but maybe in a cookie jar or something, just store something away where it's just safe. It keeps the status quo. God does not care about the status quo. God does not care about our lives keeping the status quo. He wants our lives to be fruitful. We talked about uh, the, 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 the wine, where, where, uh, vine where, <laughs> where, where Jesus comes and he prunes so that he would bear even more fruit. It's about bearing fruit. So we see that all of the Gospels, when, when it comes to to our lives, when it comes to our Christianity, when it comes to our life of faith, it talks about fruit. Where is the fruit in a life? And you know, I want to say, number one, the kingdom of God talks about bearing fruit. <laughs> and number two, uh, the fruit, it's not fruit that you have to produce outside of your means and extraordinary but to bear the fruit with what you have. To bear the fruit with what you have. You know, some of us, they're always like, the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. Sometimes we want to look at the things that we don't have. But God never says, you know, I, God could, he could say to us, I don't care about, you're reciting to me everything that you don't have, just like Moses. I, I, Lord, I, just, I can't talk, God. It's like, I didn't ask you for what you don't have. I asked you for what you do have. When Elijah came to the widow, it's like, what do you have in your house? I've got nothing. Okay, I do have some empty jars, but it's useless. It's like, well, that will do. When, when, when God asked Moses to, to sp split the sea, he asked him, what do you have in your hand? Well, nothing. Oh, yeah, maybe just a rod. Well, that will do. When God asked David, can you slay the Goliath? Like, well, I've got nothing. He couldn't even hold the shield or, or the whole armor of, of King Saul. What do you have? I've got a slingshot and a stick. <laughs> For most people, that's a reason to ridicule this little lad, right? But it's like, this enough. It's enough. What God has given you is just enough to change the world, to change your neighborhood, to change your marriage, to change the lives of your kids, to, to let God, allow God to use what he has given you and not what he has not given you. Whatever God has given you, there is something about this that, that you have to steward well. And all these parables, they're about like, what do you do with the stuff that God has given you? And you know, when... When it comes to the Apostle Paul, there is, um, when it comes to the spiritual gifts, um, there is different passages that always got my, caught my interest. And um, the one is in, in Romans chapter 12. We have here a, a list of spiritual gifts and everything. But what I like here, when it talks about the gifts of grace, he says in Romans chapter 12, and this is in verse 3, uh, second half, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. God doesn't give to everybody the equal amount, but God assigns based on your life, based on your upbringing. God knows our hearts, and he gives us specifically something. And then again in, in verse 6, it says, having the gift to differ according to the grace God has given to us. And so it, it talks here about it. And then actually when you go to 1 Corinthians about the whole thing with, this, with the spiritual gifts, the charismata, 
And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we have the same thing. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit to the common good. And then in verse 11, it talks about who the Holy Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So it's like, it's unmisunderstandably, unmis uh, unmistakably, it's like God has given us stuff. God has given us something. God has given us something. And uh, when you make an invent, make a personal inventory, I love Celebrate Recovery, at one point we make a moral inventory, but if you would have to make an inventory of your life, no matter how small the things look like, no matter how devastating your past has been, there is stuff that you got. There is stuff that today, the way that Christ redeemed you, the way that you're sitting here today, the way that you're leading your life and living your life, there is stuff that you have. You've got a house. Maybe you've got a boat. Maybe you've got a car. Maybe you've got hospitality. Maybe you can cook really well. Maybe you've, you've got a friendly face. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you've got money. Maybe God is blessing you financially. But you've got stuff. Maybe you've got only trash in your life and you feel like I've had the hardest time in my life and yet God, because of the hard life that you have experienced, God gave you a sensitive heart. More so than any other person. And when somebody comes around and they're suffering from something, you, God gives you a sense of, of feeling of a, where that person is at. Now that is the product of all the trash that has happened in your life before maybe, but this is the product that you do have. No one of us sitting here today, or standing, can say that we've got nothing. Each one of us got something. And the question is, what do you do with the stuff that God gave you? And when it comes, and when it comes to, so this is the stuff that God has given us that is, that is the means in our life to bear fruit. Now, God does not expect from me to bear fruit just like somebody else sitting here right now. God does not expect you, fill in your name, to bear the same fruit that so-and-so sitting over here. God has given you something, but what he has given you, he wants to make fruitful. Because God wants to sanctify it. God wants to make it holy. I love the scripture where, 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 where Paul um, says in 2 Timothy, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable use. Now Paul doesn't say, and that's good. <laughs> no, he says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, God wants us to be all of us, vessels for honorable use. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from, from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel of honorable use, set apart as, as holy, ready for the master of the house for every good work. We are vessels of God. We are vessels of God. Is there trash in there? <laughs> Are we vessels of dishonorable use? God challenges us, cleanse this vessel. Let these mouths be cleansed. Let these hearts be cleansed. Let those minds be filled with what I want to give to you. Don't trash yourself up in the evening if you want to do morning devotion because your mind is going to be filled with trash. What, what you bring with you, you're going to have there, right? So watch how you fill yourself. God, we are holy vessels with all these beautiful cracks inside so that God's glory can shine through us. But what is the stuff and the content that we're filling ourselves with? We, we, whatever it is that God has given us, this is what's supposed to, to, to preach from us. You know, it's not a mouth that preaches, it's a lifestyle that preaches. But the stuff that God is giving you, that's the stuff that's going to preach. That's the stuff that's going to bear fruit. That's the stuff that's going to change lives and save lives. What do you do with that stuff? What do we do with this stuff? When it comes to fruit bearing, so we have made this point plenty clear, our life 
is supposed to bear fruit. Amen? And if our life doesn't bear fruit, you know, it's like, I don't, when the master comes to settle accounts, like, man, maybe we just slip right into heaven, just, but I'm saved. But what a pitiful life that is, just to, I don't ever want to be caught at my deathbed. Looking back on my life, I just wish I would have been all sold out to God. I just wish I would have given this up or this up and just given God my all, my utmost for his highest, like Oswald Chambers says. We just want to give him our all. And we don't ever want to be caught with that, and so we have to groom this. And when it comes to now fruit bearing in a life, there's two things that will determine fruitfulness in your life. And that's the seed that you sow and the soil on which you sow. I want you, if you have a chance, write it down. The things that will most of all determine your fruitfulness in kingdom work as a Christian, the thing that will bear fruit for you as Christian is the seed you sow and on the soil that you sow. And for that, let's move back here to Matthew um, chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, we have this whole parable about the sower that never gets old. <laughs> it's a parable that never gets old. Jesus is speaking to the crowd a, a parable that he doesn't explain to them, but later on he explains it to his disciples. And he says, the kingdom of heaven is just like somebody who is going out on a field and he sows seed and some seed fell among the path and uh, the birds came and devoured them and other seeds that fell on rocky ground and when they did not have much soil and immediately they sprang up and since they had no depth of soil but when the sun arose and they were scourged and then other uh, and, and since they have no root, they withered away, and other seeds they fell on, among thorns, and the thorns grew up. The, the, the thorns grew up together with the seeds. Keep that in mind. I'm going to explain that later. But it grew up together with the seeds, and then it choked them. And some seed they fell on good soil and produced grain, and some a hundredfold, out of some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. He who has ears, let them hear. Jesus has said, like, if you have ears, listen to this. <laughs> this is good stuff. <laughs> Jesus is saying, this is good stuff. If you have ears, listen to what I just said. Take notes, write it down, burn it in your heart. What I'm just telling you, there's, there's something important about this. And it really is, because it, then when he explains it, he goes into it. But I just want to say here quickly, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 31, we have here another parable. And uh, 1331. And this is the, the mustard seed. First, I want to talk about the importance of the seeds that we sow. Okay? So the seed that we sow, here's a couple other parables. Again, it talks about the kingdom of God, everything in the framework of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. And it is the smallest of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the largest that all the gar than all the garden plants and becomes a tree. So that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, what's the quality of the seed? The quality of the seed means it's a mustard seed. It's not an apple seed. It's not a flower seed, right? If he would have sown a flower seed, could the birds of the air make nests in the tiny flower? No. It's the qual what seed are you sowing, that's what determines what's growing out of it, right? And then he goes on, uh, next parable, right, uh, next one, uh, verse 33. And he told them another parable, and the kingdom of heaven is just like 11, uh, 11, do you see 11? 11? 11, never mind. I'm Austrian, I never know those words. Uh, 11, that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leaven. Again, she uses a certain ingredients that will have bare fruit, that will do something to the whole lump of dough. I remember when we were kids, we were just watching how my mom was baking and in, in front of her stove, we, we, we watched the thing rise. We watched the thing grow slowly. It was beautiful and it smelled really good. But the thing is, leaven causes that. It's not sugar that causes it. It's not salt that causes it. It's not pepper. 
or any or, or chili powder. My dad loved chili powder above everything. But it's no other ingredients that causes it this way. It's only leaven. It, what, what seed is sown, this is what will grow out of it. And then you have another parable. You have the parable of the net. You know, when uh, it says uh, here in verse uh, 47, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gather fish of every kind. If the guy, if Jesus would have said the kingdom, Jesus did not say it, the kingdom of God is like a fisherman with one rod and one hook who catches one fish. If that would have been true, the fruit would have been only one fish. Or if you're fishing like me, none. <laughs> but it's a net. It's... A net, again, you can make analogies out of the net. If you have holes in your net, they're all going to escape. If it's a larger net, you catch more fish. If it's a smaller net, you catch less fish. If it's a surface net or a deep ocean net, it all makes a difference. Whatever you use, the means that you, the seed that God has given you, we, we have to be mind. They're not the same. Each one of us has different seeds, have different lifestyles, have different talents, have different spiritual gifts. But the seeds that we have, we have to safeguard them. There is something about the seeds that we have that uh, if we sow good seeds and at the same time we sow them in anger, at the same time, we sow good seeds. We sow the word of God with jealousy. Or we sow the, sing, see, the seeds of God, the word of God. Jesus saves, but we sow them with gossip. Or we sow them with anxiety or with fear, if you want. With anger, with something. It's like we have the seed that we sow. It needs to be preserved. And it, 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 the seed that we sow, it, it, it's, it's so precious. God is giving seed to the sower. He has given us the stuff. We have the stuff already in our life that God wants to use to bear fruit in our lives, that God wants to use to change lives. But if we allow this seed to be mingled with stuff that's coming from our human nature, stuff that's coming from our flesh, if, we, if this is mingling up, it's not going to yield its fruit. It will not yield its fruit. It's like this weed growing up side by side and actually taking away nourishment. If you, you, you can preach the gospel to somebody and yet if you harbor anger in your spirit, if there is something in your spirit that's just not right before God, the Holy Spirit cannot use that seed. The Holy Spirit, it's, it's like, yeah, you, you've, you've spoken the right stuff. You have quoted the right scripture and it bears no fruit because it doesn't smell like Jesus Christ. And we are the aroma of Christ. Watch out for the seed that God has given you. What you, what you sow is what you're going to reap. If you sow anger, you're going to reap anger. That's an old saying, but it holds true. It's a biblical saying. Watch out for the seed. And then the second one is the soil. And in this parable here in, in, in Matthew chapter 13, in the parable of the sower, um, I want to go back to it, and I mentioned something here earlier already about the thorns. Hey, let's just read it really quick. And this is not just the, what Jesus is saying to the crowd, but now uh, here is his explanation to, to his disciples. Here in the parable of the sower, his explanation, uh, his uh, exegesis basically of it when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand is um it does not understand it the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart this is what was sown along the path so that you have four four grounds the sower goes out and he sows seed and the one falls on on a path then the second one, it, it, he explains, falls on rocky ground among the thorns and the fourth one on good ground. What I like about this is that Jesus never says, oh, you unfaithful servant, why did you sow among the thorns? Why did you sow on, on rocky ground? It doesn't say that because it's not the task of the sower. The sower goes out into the field and he sows the seeds and that's his job. His job is to sow the seeds. Our job is to be the aroma of Christ. 
right? We have the, we're supposed to be the fragrance of Christ Jesus. We're supposed to be the fragrance, the aroma of Christ for those who are perishing and for those who are being saved. For one, an aroma from death to death, and for the others, an aroma from life to life. It's not for us to determine what God does with it. It is not for us to take how somebody receives the message. It is our task to preach the message, to be the witness and to be the light. Amen? And so within this parable, the sower goes out and he has not done anything wrong by where he sows, but it tells us that when we are doing kingdom work, when you're preaching to your friend, when you're praying fervently for somebody is kingdom work when you're going out and you write a letter you write a, a text message of encouragement to somebody's kingdom work when you go and 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 tell your neighbor that hey jesus saves you God, you need jesus when 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 you're out there and doing kingdom work <laughs> it says that some of the stuff that you're going to do the enemy is going to come and snatch it right away don't let it discourage you from keep doing your job. Your job is to sow the seeds. And if you sow the seed, if you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you tell people, listen, it's not about doing good stuff in your life. It's about you repenting from your sin. And if it's big sin, or if you, God doesn't care if you mur didn't murder anybody, everyone has a prideful heart and everybody needs to come and repent. If you preach the gospel, what they do with it, maybe you, you walk away from having preached that message and then you text them, you really feel good about it and, and, and God's just like, yeah, oh, that God was in that conversation, was good, and then you text the person, and the person, yeah, I forgot already all about it. I went home that day, and I had a fight with my spouse, and so, it, yeah, I, I just, I don't even think about it. Man, shoot. You know, the enemy just came and just took away. It fell on the path, and the enemy comes, but pray, pray about it. You know, there's a lot of analogies that talks about tilting the ground, working the ground. You know, and I believe that we are, we are preparing the ground, we're tilling the ground in prayer. Amen? God calls us to prayer. But so some of the seed falls on, on, and, and the enemy just comes in and he steals it right away. And then the second one, it falls on rocky ground. And it says, in, 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 and it, so it's, it's like something that's immediately received with joy, uh, but yet it has no root in himself and endures for a while. But then when the tribulation persecution arises on account of the word immediately, it falls away. Now, in my head, I always thought it's the thorns, the third one, the category where it's the suppressing obstacles of life and the oppression and the tribulation and the, um, the hardship of life that's just choking up the seed. But it doesn't talk about it. It's the second one that falls on shallow ground that when, when we don't have roots, whatever doesn't have deep roots, if we're just praying for somebody once and we leave him be and never contact him again, he's so vulnerable for the enemy to come in and snatch that. Or when the troubles hit, that person is going to throw it overboard and say, well, I just go back to my idol worship again and I worship, I don't know, whatever what. You know, but they, they're supposed to, we need to help them take roots. There's something about when the pressure of life is so, a lot of the stuff that you're going to preach, a God of uh, being a witness, a lot of the kingdom work that God has you do will fall to people and the circumstances of life for those people are going to choke it up. And they're going to choke it up. But pray for it but, and keep sowing. Just keep sowing, keep at it. And the third one is then with the thorns. And remember when Jesus said it initially to, to the crowd, and that's in the beginning of chapter 13, it says, and the thorns grew up and choked them. It's stuff that grows up alongside the good seeds. And here as he's explaining the thorns, uh, he's, it, this is actually the... <laughs> The divided heart that I sometimes mention, it's like when you have a passion for something else and for God, and the love for the world, basically. And here it says, but the cares of the world, or the love for the world, and the deceitfulness of the riches, of the riches, the, the, the fun stuff, the good stuff, the, the stuff that we're sometimes, the other stuff that we're passionate about, 
when we when we are passionate about God and yet our heart is divided we are passionate about something else and this is how we grow up it's only a matter of time until the worldly passions will suffocate the spiritual passions until we stop praying until we stop reading the word of God until we stop looking for God even in our life the other passion will grow up alongside the good stuff and will choke it up so when you're out there doing kingdom work there's a lot of stuff when 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 you preach to your neighbors or when when you're doing the kingdom work that god has assigned just for you there will be stuff there will be times when you recognize that the people that you're witnessing to um, they love something else alongside and you will be able to count it out on one hand that one day his love for this particular thing was going to choke up the good stuff in his life, the good deposit that was deposited in him. Pray into it and don't give up because there is a good ground, there is a good soil, and the, the good soil, it proves, again, it proves fruitful. And what was sown, it grows up and it yields fruit hundredfold and sixtyfold and thirtyfold. And this is the quality of the soil. So when we, and I just want to close with that, when we are in kingdom work, I felt like God wants to say to us, watch your soil, uh, watch your seed, what you sow, and watch your soil. Because it will always determine the fruitfulness. However much fruit comes forth from your life, the effectiveness of your life in God's hand. God says, God prepared us for good works that he prepared for us beforehand. But how much he can use our life and how, what a difference God can make through our life is going to be determined from the seeds that he has given you. If you say it's not good enough or it's not well enough, or if you sow that seed together alongside with criticism or with negativism or with a fear or just holding back and, or maybe laziness, uh, if that's your seed, then the fruit is not going to be there. Or it's not going to come forth in the same way that how God has intended it. That's what God wants to prune us. And the second thing is watch for the soil. Your job is to sow the seed. Don't worry about what the world is doing with it, but you can always pray into it. There's different grounds, and we are, in, in a lot of sense, we are the ground breakers. The Holy Spirit is, is showing us things as, as we're praying. He's showing us things, and we can pray into situations. Lord, pr protect that person from the enemy so that he doesn't come and snatch it away. Help that person to find a life group, to find a, a, a church home, to find something where the person can take roots so the, the worries of life are not just choking up the person. Or that the person, when, 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 when they are passionate about something else, that it would, doesn't overtake them. So a lot of our kingdom work, a lot of the kingdom work will be determined on the soil and on the seeds that we sow. And I want to challenge you today with that portion of kingdom work. Just think about that. As you're going about your business, what is the stuff that God has given you? And where, where does the soil how does how does the soil look like how does it look like in your own life the word that you receive on a daily basis, and how is your witness going and right now let's just come to the lord's table because jesus christ he gave his life for us and we have the covenant in his blood and jesus christ was all about kingdom work amen and he has our life as we're participating in the life of Christ, as we're doing this in remembrance of him, it reminds us that we are also part of kingdom work. We're not there to look pretty. We're not there to sit around and, and just have a good time, but to do a good time, basically, too, to bear fruit in our life. And Christ is the one who, who wants to make us fruitful. And if as we surrender our lives to him, he's going to cause the fruit to grow up by itself. Come on, guys.